Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Futurum Tech Webcast. I am your host today, Daniel Newman, Principal Analyst, Founding Partner at Futurum Research. Thrilled to have this conversation today talking about the network and what partner would be more interesting to bring on to talk about the network than Cisco. I think, if nothing else, warrants a top consideration for this topic. Uh, got a couple of great guests on the show. As always, uh, appreciate everybody tuning in. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. But I won't ask you to do that again until the end. So today's episode, I have Richard and Ron joining me. We're going to be talking about, uh, you know, we're going to talk about a recent, some research we did. But we're going to talk about a lot more than that. We're going to talk about kind of the big trends driving, you know, network adoption. We're going to talk about the cloud. We're going to talk about how ITDMs and CIOs need to be thinking about moving their networks forward to make them scale, scale and agile and flexible. All those fun words that we marketeers love to use, but that when you're in technology, you actually need to do. So without further ado, let me bring on the guest. Guest first, Richard, welcome to the show. Give everyone your name, your specs, talk a little bit about what you do every day at Cisco. Hey, thank you, Daniel. Uh, yes, my name is Richard Lacone. I've been working at Cisco Systems for about 21 years. Uh, been in the industry for about 25. I uh, started out in tech support, working for a company that some of you may know called 3Com. Uh, troubleshot nicks and modems, you know, all that other stuff. Understood a lot of, uh, you know, layer one, layer two. And then kind of worked my way up the stack. If you think about the OSI reference model, move to routing, move to firewalls and applications. And then kind of what I'm doing at Cisco now is, is more focused around our cloud network uh, business unit portfolio. And then trying to look at, you know, talk to different customers, trying to look, you know, obviously technical marketing, a lot of pre-sale support, working with our, our sales forces to really make sure that we're positioning and we're designing the best solution for our customers. Well, welcome to the show, Richard. Appreciate having you here. You. I know you, Ron. <laughs> we work together, but Ron, you wrote a great paper late uh, just recently with Cisco in partnership, talking about the future of the cloud and the role the network plays. Give everybody your name, your specs. Talk about what you're focused on over at Future and Research. You bet. Thank you, Daniel. And yes, uh, research director, senior analyst here. And yeah, I focus on all matters cloud, networking, 5G, you name it. It's all part of you know our ecosystem. It's a very exciting time to be in our industry. And I'm definitely looking forward to our conversation today. Absolutely. Yeah, we, Ron, we do give you a pretty large mandate and appreciate the research that you do. While you're uh, getting highlighted all over the web, I see all those uh, all those quotes in the press and stuff. People want to know what Ron Westfall is thinking. And so everyone here that's tuned in, hopefully you all want to know more about what Ron's thinking. But I'm going to get both Richard and Ron here talking a little bit about what's going on and why you know the cloud and the network are inseparable as companies are trying to move forward. I thought maybe we could start off talking a little bit about sort of what we've seen you know, over the last few years. Everybody knows that Digital transformation was exponential throughout the pandemic. We saw some companies said a decade, some said 20 years. At the very least, we probably saw a 20 to 50% speed up. By the way, that stat was completely arbitrary. But the point is, is most companies will all agree that they had some uh, speeding up of their investments in digital network, cloud technology. And I think it's kind of interesting to say, hey, now that we've had a chance, we're in the back innings. It's not over yet, guys. It's unfortunately, this thing kind of is keeps climbing on. But what are some of the big trends? You know, Richard, I'll start with you that you're really seeing right now in the wake of the pandemic that are going to you know, drive the next phase of, of infrastructure investment and, you know, other network uh, improvements. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. I'm seeing um, it's, it's kind of interesting, as you, as you mentioned, kind of the acceleration post pandemic and how this digital transformation, you know, we've been talking about it for years. Um, I remember when John Chambers you kind know, of from Cisco had talked about this, you know, many moons ago, but really what we're seeing here is this evolution of, of from operations, a focus on simplicity. Customers really want to, you know, do what they can, you know, right and have a cookie cutter or approaches. And then also they, you see a migration from bare metal to VMs to now containerization. So I think that's, you know, that's probably top of mind seeing how customers is containers have a short life and they'll spin them up, you know, maybe have them running for 24 hours and then, you know, terminate them and then spin up a new container. And then how do you network for that? But then ultimately, what's that visibility look like? You know, how, how can I drill down? 
into that level of, um, you know, virtual infrastructure, physical infrastructure, and customers really want to be able to be prepared. And you know, you don't want to see any kind of network outages or glitches or anything that's going to, you know, take them offline and, you know, lose, you know, important revenue or have some critical applications down. So that's kind of what I'm seeing around the, uh, the landscape these days. Yeah, that, that, you know, those are some of the things that are on my mind too. You know, Ron, um, I've got a few, but before I, I give mine, I, I'm going to give you the first first dibs to see, you know, kind of what are some of the big trends that you're seeing coming out that are really influencing what's going on in the network and the cloud adoption? Right on. Yeah, yeah, there's just, uh, it's amazing, the array of drivers out there. And I'll focus on uh, use cases and services. Uh, certainly, a video comes to mind, for example. While video may have killed the radio star, it will certainly help uh, save uh, the cloud star. It's it's rising, and you know we see it on the consumer side: uh, 4K, 8K video, uh, also AR, VR type of applications for multi gaming scenarios, and and so forth. Uh, but it's also certainly uh, on the work and business side. Uh, for example, we touched on work from home and distributed workforces, and that's just going to demand. Uh, more video capabilities for video collaboration, video conferencing, digital twins, uh, doing R&D from the home and so forth. So that I think is definitely a, a key driver that's across the entire uh, ecosystem. And on the industry 4.0 side, we're seeing more specialization, networking that is attuned to the specific needs of verticals. And I think that's going to become more important because whether you're talking about, for example, a 5G uh, network environment or any multi-cloud environment, uh, there's just gonna be more demand for lower latency, higher bandwidth, more uh, policy control, being able to control a fabric in real time and so forth. So I see all these things definitely interrelated and are definitely contributing to you know these trends and uh, escalating demand across the industry. Yeah, absolutely. You, you brought up a few. I like that. And, and, and if I could kind of summarize it, really that there's a huge shift of secular trends that are driving demand. It's from just going to 5G. Um, it's the mass adoption of video for all types of communications. We saw the pandemic certainly fueled that further. A higher resolution video. We don't want just video. We want good video, right? Um, and of course, you can go all the way out to the metaverse and what we're trying to do, you know, in a practical term of things like, um, you know, VR, uh, the actual application of immersive experiences. So that's definitely big. I think we're also seeing the streamlining of DevOps at scale. Companies realize how, how flexible and agile they need to be, um, you know, and, and then I think just two other trends I'd want to touch on is just how much the hybrid market has become the market, right? Hybrid cloud is the way. Um, I think there was a time where people said everything was going to public cloud. I think it's largely been decided that's not the case for all but a small subset of companies that can run everything in SaaS type applications, just not realistic. Um, and actually beyond hybrid, it's really multi. So companies based upon needs are really looking at scaling out everything they do to be able to run multiple clouds. Sometimes that is related to uh, sovereignty and redundancy issues. Sometimes it's related to certain uh, services that one cloud offers versus another that just fits the profile and the need of the customer. But across the board, it, it isn't gonna be a winner takes all. In fact, it's gonna take an ecosystem and that's something that the, one, the companies that get ecosystems are going to do particularly well. Now, with all that in mind, there are also a ton of uh, you know, challenges out there that are, that are slowing companies. So while all this adoption has been forced and everyone's accelerating and moving forward, you know, I think that being able to, you know, get to the cloud faster has been hamstrung. It's been hamstrung by culture. It's been hamstrung by the distribution of applications. It's been hamstrung by, you know, trying to bridge all these different quote unquote ops. Um, it's been, you know, hamstrung even by, you know, the speed. Companies just look at the talent issues we have right now. You know, Richard, what are you seeing? What are some of the things that, you know, I think the tech is there, but the tech is kind of always ahead of the the able, uh, the able ability for companies to implement it. What are you seeing as some of the big challenges out there? Uh, yes, you're spot on, Daniel. Ultimately, like we're seeing kind of like this, um, maybe a fear of the unknown, you know, people that want to transition, but sometimes they can't keep at space. They want to be agile, but they don't have the skill sets to necessarily adopt some of these principles and really understand. 
and and there's that you know you have some mindsets that they can't see it they don't know what's happening so it's you know kind of a faith or some understanding you know what the cloud can actually um, offer them but to your point you know we do see customers look you know not having all their eggs in one basket wanting to see if they can you know leverage something in aws or gcp or azure or oracle even and have those you know redundancy models being able to have something that leverages the different availability zones and have redundancy for dr to make sure that they can really have an application that can coexist to the exact point you're talking about is hybrid how can I have something in an application that's on-prem and in the cloud and instantiate and still have that same experience and still drive that same level of capability? And customers want that. So I think there's a, it's it's definitely a, an evolution. We're seeing more and more customers want networking architecture and they want to be able to really understand, not just understand the plumbing, but how can I, you know, really understand some of the services and maybe instantiate policy for that too? So if that I did on prem, that's there in the cloud as well. So that's kind of typically what I've been seeing. Hey, Ron, you wrote some really good stuff in this in the recent paper about cloud networking coming, you know, together and the the code. Yeah, I say interdependence upon the two. Um, but you also did point out a lot of these challenges. Um, you know, one of the ones I thought was really interesting that you point out, I mentioned, was like bridging NetOps, DevOps, SecOps. You'd think that would be easy, but not so much. No, that's uh, a reality. It's quite simply you know, the way that many of these organizations have evolved. And it stands to reason, you know, naturally you want specialization where it's warranted. That's why you have a net ops team, a DevOps team, a SecOps team, et cetera. Uh, you know, uh, there's even uh, DevSecOps and so forth. And uh, what the challenge is, is how do we really unify these domains so that they can, uh, first of all, be able to focus on their primary missions. That is, they're not having to stop and fiddle with something that is you know, on the other side. And that's where you definitely need elegant solutions that allow this unified cloud administration and so forth. It doesn't matter what the environment is, you have to have that capability uh, built in. And likewise, it's also enabling uh, the organization to streamline uh, their operations, but certainly, you know, their operation costs, uh, their business processes, and so forth. And so, yeah, this is something uh, that is going to require a cultural-wide uh, recognition. It's going to have to be driven really by the CXO decision makers to really make this uh, successful, and we're seeing progress in that regard. However, it's a journey. It's something that's going to take time, and it, there's going to be hits and misses, and hopefully <laughs> there will be more hits uh, than misses, uh, but I think we're definitely learning some object lessons as to how to really optimize that hybrid multi-cloud environment to the competitive advantage of that organization using them. Absolutely. So in the paper, we, we provided several, what we kind of say are the key requirements to really bridge this gap in bringing network and cloud together to enable the enterprise, every organization on the planet to make the right investments, to build the most efficient enterprise, um, to leverage its data, to run its applications, to you know, connect in a, in a hybrid and remote world, whatever, all those things, right? And so what I'd love to do with both of you as uh, sort of the meat uh, of the conversation is kind of do the rundown identified five of those, you know, sort of trend lines or those, those topic starters. The first thing that I thought was really well um, considered or well pointed out, Ron, in, in the paper was just the importance of best in class infrastructure. Um, because let's face it, not all is created equal. Why did you think that, you know, Beyond the obvious, why is it not all equal? Why do you know customers need to really focus on getting their infrastructure right? Yeah, I think it's a definitely one of the key fundamental pillars. And when you hear the term best in class infrastructure, you have to uh, wonder what does that mean? And, you know, you have to separate the hype uh, from the reality. And so I think it's an opportunity to understand, you know, why uh, can an organization consider uh, what can be called best in class all the way from the ASIC to the cloud networking principles themselves. In other words, you know, what do customers gain with uh, being able to use custom silicon and being able to drive their cloud networking strategies? And so uh, we see you know, capabilities such as rich telemetry, 
uh, secure and always-on capabilities, uh, multi-dimensional testing that's based on real-world customer deployments, and uh, also being able to apply verified scalability design guides you know, that go beyond you know, the theoretical hardware support uh, capabilities, again, separating hype uh, from reality. And uh, Richard, I think this is a great opportunity to talk about you know, what Cisco contributes in this regard. Yeah, spot on, Ron. I think, um, and as as Daniel had kind of stated up front, is you know a lot of times customers are, are we've all talked about software defined, right? But we all know software has to run on hardware, and you know obviously you know looking at best in class infrastructure starts like from the ASIC and all the way up to the the software components, maybe to the controller, how that process is being managed, um, you know scheduling, you know whatever whatever day two operations of visibility you need. But having that custom silicon, that rich telemetry that you mentioned, being able to you know send that out to a, a data lake and ingest that information is is paramount right now because customers want to see that visibility. But imagine having that ASIC level visibility where you can understand the boxes, the buffers, the queue drops, the kind of things that customers really want to know and understand. Kind of like popping the you know the the hood of your car and looking at the engine. A lot of the times people don't pop up the open the box of a switch, but there's a, there's custom silicon there that Cisco has been creating for years. And there's very few vendors that actually build their custom silicon. But what you get with that is understanding, you know, the true scalability for multidimensional type of tests that you talked about. I think that's something that customers kind of walk away with that confidence. You know, they see transparency there. They see, okay, we understand that, yes, this engine can drive 210 miles per hour. We're not going to be doing that, you know, for maybe, maybe five, I shouldn't be doing that, but they want to see, you know, more of a drag race and sometimes theoretical boxes or theoretical specifications will, will quite a quote numbers that, you know, when you have, when you start turning on multi features, you know, simultaneously outside of the control plane and the data plane, you know, there's some kind of contention there. So you want to make sure that you can characterize that CPU utilization, understand that memory footprint, and really start looking at these features from the best in class infrastructure to what it can support for the customers. And I think when you see that stuff, you know, some of the stuff that you have built inside that flexibility, but ultimately the security, I think that's, those are the kind of the cool things that the custom silicon at Cisco can really offer to our customers. And that really cues it up uh, because uh, a, another key pillar we identified in our research is automated secure connectivity. And uh, as we see, there are about 90% of Cisco customers are building EVPN VX LAN fabrics and growing them beyond uh, single sites. And so what uh, we are very interested in knowing more about is how can users encrypt uh, their WAN links uh, to be secure? In other words, uh, capabilities such as CloudSec, you know, a product of cloud scale ASICs, how can that then be automated across a multi-site fabric or do these customers actually have to know which chip does what? That sounds pretty intricate and a potential barrier. What, what's Cisco bringing to the table in this regard? No, that's a good point, Ron. And, and, it, and it kind kind of looks into the consistency of operations. Um, as you as you kind of stated there, we, we are seeing customers, you know, post pandemic have exp exponential growth. And there's no longer just a single site. They have multiple data center fabrics for obviously for geo redundancy, for for the be able the ability to have that flexibility to migrate different resources again hybrid, cloud uh, operations. But they want something that's turnkey as well. So how could I leverage something? And here's an example we can talk about with Nexus Dashboard when it's using a co-hosted application like our Fabric controller that has the ability for me as a as an end user or for a customer. Because there's a spectrum of, of NetOps folks, as we talked about. There's some NetOps folks that can drive a CI/CD pipeline, that can do infrastructure as code, and they understand it's a journey, not a destination. But there's also times where something a customer just needs something that's out of the box that works. Something that I could do to automate fabrics, multiple sites, but then what about those data center interconnect properties? Can I just simply check a box and, and enable encryption over those links? You can do that with NDFC, and I can do that consistently across the Nexus platforms with the cloud scale ASICs. So I think those are kind of cool things that you get from the customer. Maybe they may take for granted because you don't, you know, you're not understanding which product does what, which chipset does what. It's there, it's consistent, it's uniform. And I like, and you know, I'm just kind of dating myself there. It's kind of almost like plug and play. So it's it's kind of certain things that you can get from that automation with security without compromise. I think those are the cool things that you want to get. 
So what is a uh, plug and play date you to? Does that date you to being like a millennial? I'm trying to think like, what, what are we dating ourselves to? So if it's something's plug and play, um, let's, uh, let's kind of wrap on these bullet points here with one more. Um, and then, you know, what I want to do for all the listeners out there is I want to give them some of your great advice from, from all of you on kind of how to, how to carry the torch forward. But, you know, a couple of the other areas, Ron, that, that we pointed out in this paper was all about unified management policy, um, and then, of course, the the pervasive visibility to insights. You mentioned something in your last comment, Richard, about that was sort of policy driven, right? The ability to give to create uh, and, and enable through policy. But just how important is getting the, you know, getting the right tools with the right set of unified management and policy to being able to do this at scale and in, in in a large organization? Absolutely important. I think that was the question for me, right, Daniel? Oh yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah, no worries. So, so I think from when we're looking at the unified management and policy perspective, you know, customers um, they want to have uh, the ability to allow certain endpoints to communicate or certain endpoints to be blocked. You know, typically in the um, the you know the the previous generations, it was all about ACLs, ACLs. You know, then if there's ACLs based on subnets, based on TCP, UDP port numbers, but then we kind of moved up the stack and just focused on applications. Should my web server be allowed to talk to this DB server in this location? Probably not. Or when it should be, what, you know, what ports am I going to allow and pinhole open? So I think customers want to have something that's unified with regards to the capability of managing that from the infrastructure perspective, but also, you know, how to drive application centric segmentation. And then how do I have the ability to look at my policy when it needs to do some type of service insertion? If I need this traffic or this flow to be steered into a firewall, how is that unified? And that's something that we kind of can see with our Nexus dashboard again, plugging that tool, but the ability to show with an ACI fabric, how we can kind of steer traffic to maybe a PAN firewall, a checkpoint firewall, a Cisco firewall, and, and being able for the customer to use that as a single pane of glass, if you will, to get that visibility, understand the health of that other device, whether it's an F5 load balancer as well. And then customers can kind of take that experience, that unification, see the policy that's intact, and then also have something with compliance where they want to make sure they can run compliance to make sure if there's any type of deviation, if these applications all of a sudden start communicating, I'm uh, you know indicated or alarmed instantaneously. I think those are the kind of things we want to make sure that we're giving those customers that ease of mind and that understanding that when they configure policy, it's there intact and that they can management and from a day two ops perspective. And this aligns what uh, we see with our research, uh, that is having that unified view across bare metal, a uh, virtual machine and container based instances that you've pointed out, uh, Richard. And I think uh, that's going to be a, a difference maker in terms of how they are able to advance their journey, but also in how they you know, evaluate uh, solutions out there. And we're certainly seeing uh, capabilities such as load balancing and firewalls and database workloads being at the top of the list of this is something that we really need to understand what's going on. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter if it's uh, on our premises, it doesn't matter if it's at a low co-location space or if it's in the public cloud, we have to know what's going on with that application all the time, like full life uh, cycle management. And so this is definitely something that's uh, aligning uh, with our perspective. Yeah, you guys definitely hit a lot of things on the head there. And I think for everyone out there, what I always love from these kinds of uh, conversations is, hey, let's take it back to action. Let's take it back to what people out there that are running, you know, IT environments that are trying to think about this. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that I still think it's early days. I, I love hearing about workloads in the cloud, but anybody that's that's actually done the numbers realizes that we've got so many more workloads to move <laughs> than we have workloads that are actually there which is crazy considering the multi-billion dollar businesses that we've seen hyperscale cloud become. But that's just to say how important IT is. Remember though, everything runs on a chip and everything from there needs a lot of compute, a lot of horsepower, a lot, you know, so it's, it's, it's exciting times for the industry. So let's, uh, you know, let's think about this thing through what are the calls to action? You know, as customers that are looking to invest in cloud networking solutions, um, what do you recommend for them to be thinking about next? Uh, Ron, I'll let you go first because I let Richard go first quite a few times. Fair enough and no problem. And yeah, excellent question. I, I see, for example, uh, just you know, based on our conversation, 
the need for having a trusted advisor that can not only uh, support the uh, products, uh, for example, that has the portfolio to address all of these uh, different challenges, but also uh, quite simply the service support capabilities, uh, because it truly is a journey. And this is something that's going to require, you know, being able to work with that partner who can really address a full array of these items that we talked about. And so I think that's going to be a, a key takeaway item. And in addition, I think it, it goes back to the ecosystem uh, aspect that uh, you emphasized, Daniel, that uh, you really need a player uh, that can work with a, a dynamic set of partners. It's not just being able to work with partners that are already certified today, but as we know, you're going to have to onboard new applications, work with developers from different organizations, and very much a open-ended dynamic fashion. And so you really need to, I think, work with an organization that knows how to handle that uh, in a holistic, scalable way. And so I think uh, those are you know, definitely uh, recommendations uh, that uh, I can say with uh, full confidence in our conversations, you know, talking with uh, all the uh, players out there, both on the enterprise side, the operator side, but also in terms of, you know, third party developer side. So these are all important. So Richard, what did he miss? No, I think, you know, I think Ron covered, um, you know, all the main talking points from, you know, service and support to having the trusted advisors, because, you know, essentially, typically what we think that CEO, CIOs or, you know, different various managers are thinking is how do they build and operate an infrastructure that's for a distributed enterprise? Because that's what we're seeing. These teams are now are looking for them, looking for tools, right, that's going to help them manage the infrastructure. And, you know, obviously during this transformation, you know, how do they offer the users this cloud-like experience? And I think that's what we're going towards this evolution that's becoming a trend. And I, this is where I see that we, Cisco, are addressing this growth in hybrid cloud networks, providing ITs with a, you know, a much needed operational tool to configure and manage, you know, multi-sites as we talked about, multi-cloud deployments with that single view. And then it allows the IT customers to get that deeper, granular network visibility for troubleshooting, compliance, and then things like, you know, boosting storage, you know, there's ways to boost your storage performance, let's do it. And then you can ultimately transition to these new cloud principles, these new cloud environments with these operational models. And as, as you said, it, Daniel, it's, it's a journey. And I think this is what we're trying to do and, and bring that capability to simplify. I think that's what customers want. They want to be able to simplify these interconnecting separate sites, whether it's, you know, different fabrics, but to point that support that from a single point of consistent policy and management for that, you know, granular level of segmentation. I know that's a mouthful. There's a lot of stuff I covered there, but that's kind of typically what I'm thinking is kind of what we want to kind of tell the leaders out there what they should be thinking about. Yeah. And in our, um, the research that we, you know, we published, we definitely gave a kind of a checklist and you guys hit a lot of them. I was going to, you know, see if you guys let me down and left any gaps, but you really didn't. So I don't need to, 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 you know, fill any backstops on that particular topic. What I will say is, is there is about a six point checklist that we gave to help, you know, ITDMs, CIOs, if you're leading basically the enterprise scale out of your network or cloud deployments that you probably want to pay attention to. We'll put that in the show notes. So if you haven't had a chance to read the paper, check out the link in the show notes. But, you know, Richard, Ron, just want to thank you both. Great conversation. Really enjoyed the opportunity to sit down and talk about this with you. This topic isn't going anywhere. In fact, it's going to be a bigger topic in a year. It's going to be more important. Those secular trends we started with, those challenges will get bigger. And those calls to action are going to be more important that you, uh, whoever you are out there, are executing upon all of them, at least most of them. So, Richard, Ron, thanks for joining me here today on the Future in Tech webcast. We appreciate you. Have a good day. Thanks, Good day. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Good day. All right, everybody out there, hit that subscribe button. Join us for future episodes. We've got great conversations, interviews, thought leaders all across the tech stack that join us here on this Future in Tech webcast. We hope that you will be joining us more often. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. For Ron, for Richard, for myself, see you all later. Bye now.